Today I'd like to talk to you about research I was involved in in sequencing an ancient pandemic strain of Yersinia pestis from the Plague of Justinian. And then I'd also like to broaden it up a bit and talk about how ancient DNA has contributed to reconstructing the history of plague, uh, what are some biases of this technique, and how we can move forward in the future. So the first historic pandemic of plague, Plague of Justinian, spread through North Africa, the Mediterranean, Europe, pretty much all of the known world in those days in 541 AD, causing massive mortalities. It recurred in waves of between eight to 20 years until the eighth century. And before the advent of ancient DNA techniques, it was debated as to whether the modern etiological agent of plague, Yersinia pestis, could be implicated in this first pandemic, even though contemporary sources do talk about symptoms in specific and precise terms, especially the characteristic buboes, which then they're named to the bubonic plague. And so when we're talking about the modern etiological agent of plague, Yersinia pestis, um, we want to talk about relationships between strains. And so in 2013, a big study of 133 genomes, mostly modern, but one ancient genome from the Black Death, was published by Triadol. And um, what they found and what they uh, saw was that the third pandemic strains, which are in branch one, are descended from the ancient Black Death strains, which are very near the node there. And so um, a couple important findings here were that they saw when they tried to date the split from the most recent common ancestor uh, was that there was a variable rate of evolution between branches. And also, uh, most of their samples are uh, from Asia and China in particular. So while there are human and animal rodent strains, um, they come mostly from China, although there are a few from the former Soviet Union and Africa, the United States. Um, so already we, we are starting to see some sampling biases. Um, but the, the positioning of the ancient Black Death strain begs the question, uh, first of all, was the first pandemic Yersinia pestis? And second of all, is it also ancestral to the second and by extension the third pandemic? And so Vishman and Rupa in 2005 did positively identify Yersinia pestis DNA in uh, samples that date from the period of the Plague of Justinian. So the answer to that question is yes. And then in 2013, another team genotyped five key SNPs from the same cemetery. Um, and they narrowed down the phylogenetic position to between two nodes on this tree. But still, we were left with the question, is the Plague of Justinian ancestral to the Black Death? And so our collaborators sent material from this cemetery to us, and I have a feeling that it's going to be discussed in detail right after me, so I'll just say a few brief things that the, um, the individual that we got the best DNA from comes from a double internment. The grave goods date it to the second half of the 6th century, and it was also radiocarbon dated um, to 533 AD plus or minus 98 years, so within the right time frame. And we extracted the DNA from teeth from this individual, and it has already been touched on, but I want to mention that anytime you extract DNA from archaeological remains, it's a mixture of many, many different things. So you have the target DNA, which is, in this case, your sinic testis. You have bacteria uh, from the individual themselves, the microbiome. You have DNA from the individual. You have DNA from the burial environment, other bacteria, plants, fungi. You might have modern contamination from people who have excavated or handled these samples. So usually your target proportion, especially if we're talking about plague, is very, very low on the order of a fraction of a percent. And so in order to uh, not have to sequence these samples into oblivion, we use uh, enrichment techniques. And so for this study, we did two different techniques. We used array enrichment in which our probes are uh, supported on a solid substrate. And we did in solution enrichment, in which our probes are in a solution and they're biotinylated so that they can pulled, be pulled out and captured on strip cavity coated magnetic beads. And what we targeted in these enrichments was the pan genome of Yersinia pastis. And so this is the core genome, that's genomes that are shared 
between many or all strains of modern extant Yersinia pestis and the non-core genome, which are genes that are maybe individual to specific strains. And we did this to try to not bias our measurement, to try to capture uh, anything that is in these ancient samples that is Yersinia pestis. And so when we did that, we were able to do a draft genome sequence. It was at 7.6x, which is a fairly low coverage genome. Um, we mapped to CO92 reference sequence um, with a cutoff of 21 base pairs as being our smallest fragment, and we got about 91.5% coverage of this chromosome. And we also mapped to its plasmids, and we got both higher breadth and depth of coverage of these plasmids. And this amount of coverage let us uh, infer the phylogenetic position of this strain. And so when we make a tree here, we see in purple at the bottom, those are the third pandemic strains. In orange are the second pandemic strains, and you can see they're very close to that node, and they're ancestral. But when we look at our Justinian strains in green there, we see that they are farther from this node. They're not ancestral to the Black Death, and then they're not, therefore, ancestral to the third pandemic strains. Um, and they're interleaved between rodent strains that come from China, um, which suggests that it's a possibility that this strain arose somewhere in China and spread via whatever route, we can't say that, um, from there. Um, but again, remember our sampling bias that most of our modern strains do come from China. Uh, we also tried to date the split um, using BEAST, and so we did a few different methods. So first we input all the tip dates as is, and that's in light green, and then we used the two ancient samples, the Black Death and the Justinian, to calibrate the tree as fossils, and that's in light blue, and then we assumed all modern samples came from the year 2000, and then we input the real dates for the two ancient strains, that's in dark blue, and then we did the same thing with the modern samples, except we switched the dates of the Black Death and the Justinian strains. And all of these estimates overlap. So this suggests the same thing that we saw with the previous phylogeny, that there's a very variable rate of evolution. Um, we're maybe seeing boom and bust cycles with the epidemics and then the epizootics. Um, so it's really hard uh, to, to put any sort of temporal structure on a tree. And this was important at this time because people were suggesting that earlier pandemics of plague couldn't possibly have been your city pestis, and now it's been demonstrated very clearly that it is, uh, it did arise much earlier than the Justinian plague. Um, another thing we found in this strain was that when we looked beyond that uh, single reference genome of CO92 into our core or non-core data, we found the presence of this DFR4 or different region 4, which is the 15 uh, kilobase. Uh, pair long uh, genomic island that's present in some strains of Yersinia pestis, but not others. And so what you're looking at in this figure is that the red on the edges are the regions where there's overlap between the CO92 reference and this other reference, Microtus, that has this DFR4 region. And so the gray is the DFR4 region, and you can see, yes, the coverage is variable, it's low in places, but it's present there. And so I think this highlights the importance of looking beyond a single reference strain and trying to tell the whole story, trying to look uh, deeper into your data and make sure you're not missing any pieces. And so if we kind of jump forward a bit, um, I want to use the strains that were sequenced recently from a very late second pandemic site in Marseille. These come from about 1722 to sort of highlight how important it is to get additional ancient samples. So uh, the colors have changed a little bit in this slide. So the first pandemic sequence is in blue there. Second pandemic that I've been talking about is that higher one in green. And then the Marseille ones are there in red. And what we can see here is that uh, the Marseille strains show that they have some ancestry in this Black Death strain. But similar to the Justinian, they seem to be either extinct or unsampled in modern lineages. And this suggests to us that it's possible that some strains of the Black Death seeded reservoirs that were accessible to Europe during the second pandemic, uh, and other strains may have spread back uh, via some route to China to sequence, or Asia in general, to uh, seed reservoirs 
that led then to the third pandemic, whereas the first pandemic didn't see any reservoir that lead, led to later epidemics. But if these Marseille samples had been the first that we sequenced, if we didn't have those Black Death samples, we might be telling the same story that we're telling about the Justinian plague, that it left no descendants. And so it's so important that we continue to sequence ancient strains of uh, Yersinia pestis, to continue to add more data points, to continue to add resolution to our picture, so that we're really telling the story instead of uh, just coming up with hypotheses, even though that's an important part of science. Um, and so I think you'll hear from later presenters about more ancient strains of Yersinia pestis, uh, to continue to develop our picture of the history of this pathogen. And so by sequencing additional ancient strains, we can look at differences in how different pandemics have spread and persisted, and we can create new theories on the directionality of the spread and how they've, uh, what, where they've seen the rest for us and that type of thing. But it's only possible if we work together as an interdisciplinary team of archaeologists and historians and anthropologists and biologists and bioinformaticians and mathematicians. It takes a lot of different types of brains to work on this and to be able to really tell the full story of plague. And so with that, I'd like to thank the really interdisciplinary team uh, that was a part of this research. And I'd like to thank you for listening and uh, the discussion period. I'd be happy to answer any questions.